1869, man performed two feats that staggered the imagination of the American public. One took place in mid-July, 250,000 miles from planet Earth, when man first landed on the moon. The other took place in October, here on planet Earth on a baseball diamond, when the 101 underdog New York Mets became the world champions of baseball. How did the American public react to both events? They used one word. Amazing! 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 It's just amazing! an exciting year for baseball. It marked professional baseball's 100th anniversary and the inauguration of the league championship series. And now the World Series, the New York Mets and the Baltimore Orioles. The Baltimore Orioles dominated the American League East and took three straight from the Minnesota Twins in the first American League championship series. Most experts rated the Birds as one of the strongest, best-balanced ball clubs ever sent into a World Series by the American League. In hitting, fielding, pitching, power, speed, and experience, they have the likes of such proven stars as Frank Robinson, Boog Power, Brooks Robinson, Dave Johnson, Mark Belanger, Don Buford, and Paul Blunt. Baltimore was the logical favorite against the amazing New York Mets, whose dramatic performance in 1969 was the talk of the nation. From the depths of the second division, the champions of the National League East, the National League champs following a three-game sweep over the Atlanta Braves. Baltimore owner Jerry Hoffberger had a right to be confident, along with manager Earl Weaver and such American League greats as Ted Williams and league president Joe Cronin. It's a perfect day in Baltimore's Memorial Stadium. The cameras are poised, ready to bring to millions of fans the beginning of one of the truly remarkable World Series. Baltimore's ace left-hander, 24-game winner Mike Cuellar, handles the Mets easily in the top of the first. Mets manager Gil Hodges names 25-game winner Tom Seaver to start for New York. Don Buford, Baltimore's leadoff winner, quickly jolts young Seaver with a home run. Here's that home run again. Watch Ron Swoboda. Did he go back fast enough or far enough? One to nothing Baltimore. Cuellar's speed and screwball handcuffed the all right handed Mets batting order. Ron Swoboda is baffled by the screwball. Inning after inning, Cuellar shows his effectiveness. Cleon Jones, the Mets leading hitter, has trouble getting a good piece of the ball. as does Don Clendenin, the Mets' leading slugger. In the bottom of the fourth, Seaver gets into trouble. Elrod Hendricks single. With two outs, the Orioles have a man on first. Dave Johnson walks, moving Hendricks to second. Mark Belanger, singles to right. Here comes Swoboda's throw. Hendricks scores. Johnson goes to third. 
Then on first and third, two out, the Orioles leading two to nothing. Pitcher Mike Cuellar at the plate. He bloops a base hit to left. Johnson scores easily. Belanger goes to second. Cuellar is on first. Three to nothing in favor of Baltimore as a harried Tom Seaver faces Don Buford. And now a belt in the right field. Caroms off the wall. Belanger scores easily. Buford has himself a double. Seaver finally gets the third out, but the Orioles wind up with a four to nothing lead. And there's happiness in Birdland. Seventh inning for the Mets, Clendenin batting. Mets still behind four to nothing. Clendenin singles for only the third hit of the game off Cuellar. Swoboda walks. Clendenin going to second. And for the first time in this 1969 World Series, the Mets have two men on base. After Ed Charles flies out, Jerry Grody's the batter. He rips one to left. Clendenin holds at third, and the bases are loaded for the Mets with only one out. Al Weiss at the plate. On the sacrifice fly, the left fielder Buford, Clendenin tags up and scores. And the Mets score their very first World Series run ever. In Baltimore, they call Brooks Robinson the human vacuum cleaner, and now you'll see why. Pinch hitter Rod Gasper tops a tough one to third. Robinson comes in, makes a sensational play for the third out. And this play proved to be the turning point of the game. In the top of the ninth, with the Mets trailing four to one, Swoboda's the batter. Cuellar can't find the handle, and Swoboda has a leadoff single. Cuellar gets the next two Mets, and then Al Weiss walks on four pitches to put runners on first and second. Coming up to pinch hit for the Mets is home run threat Art Shamsky, the potential tying run and the pressure now is on Cuellar. Shamsky grounds out, and the Baltimore Orioles win the opening game of the World Series 4-1. to one. Fans show up early for game two of the 1969 World Series to watch infield practice and Brooks Robinson. Brooks Robinson, the man with a magic mitt and great hands. American League's annual Golden Glove winner explains his game-saving play on Rod Gaspar. Well, I think the secret of the play is to keep in mind that you cannot look at the runner, and if the ball has stopped or is coming to a halt, always use your bare hand. And consequently, when I feel the ball with my bare hand, I always come up and throw overhand. Colorful pregame activities seem to brighten hopes for a New York Mets bounce back. Rooting for the Mets to get even, St. Louis manager Red Shandy, the great Stan the Man Musial, National League President Warren Giles, and the owner of the Mets, Mrs. Joan Payson. Starting pitchers are left-handers Dave McNally and Jerry Kuzman. Mrs. Babe Ruth, accompanied by Ted Williams, Commissioner Bowie Kuhn, and Joe DiMaggio, throws out the first ball. 20-game winner Dave McNally holds the Mets scoreless in the first three innings, aided by outstanding Oriole fielding. Here's that play again, slowed down. Tommy Agee seems to have a base hit, but Mark Belanger displays the skills which have made him one of baseball's outstanding shortstops. Not to be outdone, Jerry Kuzman gets some sparkling support too, and it happens to come from his shortstop, Bud Harrelson. In slow motion, it looks as though Harrelson doesn't have a chance.
Top of the four, a scoreless tie. Don Clendenon batting for New York. Don tags it, and the Mets take the lead, one to nothing. That home run, incidentally, ends a streak of 23 scoreless innings compiled by McNally in postseason competition. McNally retires the next two Mets. Now Jerry Grody's up. Brooks Robinson charges in and duplicates the great play he made in the first game. The Birds have one of the best ground crews in baseball, or is it the best looking? 13-year-old Linda Wehrhein has a dusting routine midway through the game that completely charms the Mets third base coach, Eddie Yost. Linda almost has Eddie rooting for the Orioles. Almost. Going into the bottom of the seventh, tension in the stands mounts as Jerry Kuzman is working on a no-hitter. Can Kuzman join Don Larson as a World Series no-hit pitcher? There are only nine outs to go as Paul Blair leads off. And there it goes, a clean hit to the left side. The first one off Jerry Kuzman in the second game of the World Series. Two outs later, Blair is still on first. On the second pitch to Brooks Robinson, Blair gets a big jump and heads for second. And he has it. Brooks Robinson, a great clutch hitter, steps up and drives the next pitch through the middle. Blair scores from second, and the Orioles tie it up at one off. With Brooks Robinson at first, Ed Charles comes up with an outstanding play to end the inning. Even in slow motion, that ball looks like it's hit like a bullet. But Charles snares it on the bounce. In the Mets' top of the ninth with two down and the score still tied at one to one, Ed Charles shows he can do things with his bat, too. The Mets finally hit a ball past Brooks Robinson and now have the possible go-ahead run on first base. With a count two and two and Jerry Grody batting, Gil Hodges puts on the hit and run. Grody finds the same hole, and Charles wheels all the way to third on the single to left. McNally now faces Al Weiss, one of the Mets' modest heroes. Base hit. Ed Charles comes home, and the Mets are back in front, two to one. Kuzman ends the Mets ninth as he bounces out. The Langer to Powell. McNally, who's pitched a fine game, needs runs as the Mets lead two to one. With two out in the last of the ninth and Frank Robinson coming up, manager Gil Hodges sends second baseman Al Weiss to the outfield. The Mets now have four outfielders. Gil explains his strategy. We played four outfielders uh, with Frank Robinson at bat, mainly to cut down the chances of getting an extra base hit. If we can keep Frank Robinson on first base, why we have a much better chance of winning. Kuzman walks Robinson. Frank seems to limp a little from a sore left foot. Kuzman now has to face Big Boog Powell, the Baltimore cleanup batter. Powell walks. The tying run goes to second. Powell's on first. And the always dangerous Brooks Robinson coming up. Out of the dugout comes manager Hodges to replace Kuzman. The young left-hander expresses his feelings at this moment. I was a little depressed not being able to finish the ball game, but after I heard all the applause, it kind of left my mind, and I was real thankful just to be able to play in a World Series. As Ron Taylor comes in to relieve, the situation is ticklish for the Mets. Brooks Robinson's the batter. Powell's on first, and pinch runner Marv Rettmund is on second. On the 3-2 pitch, both runners are going. A ground ball to third. Ed Charles makes a split-second decision, throws to first. Out! The game is over. The Mets win it 2-1. to one. 
their first World Series victory, and the series is now tied at one game apiece. A happy airline hostess greets the victorious Mets as they board their charter flight for New York City, where the next three games will be played. It's wonderful to fly the friendly skies when that flight leads home. And home is beautiful Shea Stadium on the edge of Flushing Meadow Park. Big Shea, where the amazing Met fans pour in by the thousands. Starting pitchers for game three are rookie Gary Gentry and Jim Palmer. Celebrities seem to be everywhere. But of course, the real celebrity of the Shea Stadium are the amazing fans with their ubiquitous banners. The spirit of the Met fans seems to stimulate the Met players. They believe their fans and vice versa. Tommy Agee, first man up for the home team, reacts to the fans' enthusiasm with this tremendous shot. Home run to center. Score, one to nothing, New York. Second inning for the Mets. Jerry Grody walks with two outs. Switch hitter Bud Harrelson bats left-handed against the right-handed Palmer. Harrelson singles to center. Grody stops at second. Gary Gentry is the batter. The weak-hitting rookie pitcher surprises center fielder Paul Blair. It's over his head for a double, scoring Grody and Harrelson. Three to nothing, Mets. In the fourth inning, Gentry pitches to Frank Robinson. It's a sinking liner to left. Cleon Jones dies for it. Did he get it? Let's look again. No, on the first bounce, says umpire Hank Storr. With Robinson on first, Boog Powell's up. Powell bounces a hit to right. Robinson goes to third. With men on first and third and two outs, Gentry faces L. Rod Hendricks. The scene is now set for one of the great catches in World Series history. Hendricks belts it to deep left center. A.G. races for it. What a play. Let's watch that amazing catch again in slow motion as Tom A.G. robs the Baltimore Orioles of two big runs. Sixth inning now, the Mets' Ken Boswell at bat with a score still three to nothing in favor of the Mets. It's a ground ball wide at first. Dave Johnson makes a fine play. Pitcher Palmer covers but misses the bag, and Boswell is safe. Ed Cranepool's slow bouncer moves Boswell to second. Jerry Grody up. And he promptly doubles down the left field line. Boswell trots in with another run, making the score four to nothing in favor of the Mets. And the Mets fans let loose. The Royals top of the seventh. There are two men down when Gentry walks himself into a jam. He starts it by walking Mark Belanger. Baltimore's Dave May. Pinch hitting for pitcher Jim Palmer also walks. Belanger goes to second. There's a breeze blowing through Shea Stadium as Gentry faces Don Buford. Buford also walks to load the bases. And suddenly, the Mets have a crisis. Gentry can't get that third out. Manager Gil Hodges does some walking of his own out to the mound. Hodges now makes a daring decision. He's taking the rookie out 
after he pitched three hit ball for six and two thirds innings. And Jeffrey gets an ovation as he comes to the Mets dugout. Manager Hodges and the Mets pin their hopes on young Nolan Ryan, the fireballing strikeout artist. There's no place to put the next batter, Paul Blair. The bases are loaded, two outs. Strike one. Strike two. And get ready now for a play that'll be talked about for years. Blair connects. And Tommy Agee does it again. Another miracle catch. There have been other great fielding plays in World Series history, but never before has one man made two such dramatic and crucial catches in one game. A.G. alone has cost Baltimore at least five runs. Thrill to it again in slow motion. A.G.'s diving, skidding, one-handed catch with the bases loaded once again saves the Mets. In the Mets eight, Ed Cranepool, the only Met who's been with him since their first year, hits his first series homer, making the score five to nothing in favor of the National League champion. And that smile tells it all, from the cellar to the World Series. That's right, fantastic. Top of the ninth now, with the Mets still ahead five to nothing and two outs. Mark Belanger walks. The next batter is Clay Dalrymple, pinch hitting for the pitcher. Al Weiss makes a beautiful stop, but Belanger beats the play. The next batter, Don Buford. Walks to load the bases. Once again, the Mets are in trouble. They're only one out away from winning game three, but Baltimore has the bases loaded. Manager Hodges talks it over with his battery and decides to let Ryan meet the challenge. The 22-year-old Texan proves his manager's faith is well-founded. He gets two strikes on the dangerous Paul Blair. One more to go. Strike three win their second straight, five to nothing, and now lead in the World Series, two games to one. Met fever is contagious. The entire country is fascinated by the unfolding drama of the underdog Mets more than holding their own against the powerful, highly touted Baltimore Orioles. The news media transmit a steady, rhythmic flow of glowing words and pictures to an anxious, dazzled world. The next day at Shea Stadium, everyone is still talking about Tommy Agee, including the greatest center fielder of all time, Joe DiMaggio. Well, I think they're both very fine catches. I would have to say they're a comparable of the one that Willie Mays made in the 1954 World Series when the Giants were playing the Cleveland Indians. I think his first one in particular, because at that time, those runs were important. And uh, to make the catch, be I thought that the fence, and he was conscious of the fact that he was so close to that fence that uh, he had to time that ball, and when he did catch the ball, he went into the fence. A.G. also talks about A.G. Well, the second catch uh, was hit in the right center field alley, and I think this was an easier catch for me because it was on my glove side, and I ran, over, I ran just about as far, but the fact that it was on my glove side made it a little bit easier. And the wind brought, it, brought the ball back to the infield a little bit, the reason why I had to dive for it, I think. When I got to the ball, then I felt like I was going to catch it. But when I started after the ball, I didn't know whether I was going to catch it or not. In the fourth game, the two pitching aces, Mike Cuellar of Baltimore and Tom Seaver of the Mets, meet again. Fans start pouring into Shea Stadium. In the second inning, Cuellar faces Don Clendenin, a key man in the Mets' pennant drive. Clendenin swings and rockets one into the Baltimore bullpen, and for the third straight game, the Mets lead one to nothing. This is Clendenin's second home run of the series, and before it's over, he's to hit another, setting a record for a five-game World Series. Don Clendenin.
In the Orioles' third is Tom Seaver against Mark Belanger. Belanger singles to right, and the tying run is on base. With no outs in the pitcher up now, the Mets look for the bunt. Ed Charles creeps in from third, but Cuellar squares around, chops, and loops it over the infield for a base hit. The Orioles now have men on first and second with no one out. Don Buford's up again, and the Mets expect a bunt. But once again, the Orioles cross them up. Buford swings away, and Clendenin makes a beautiful play. With men on first and third, Paul Blair at bat, tries to beat out a bunt. Seaver feels the ball and throws him out. Buford goes to second. Melanger holds third. Two outs, and Frank Robinson up. Robinson lifts a high pop foul. Clendenin waits, waits, and squeezes it to end the inning. Nancy Seaver cheers her favorite team and her favorite pitcher. The umpires now enter the drama. Manager Earl Weaver disputes a call strike from the Baltimore bench. Jag Crawford, the plate umpire, has a few things to say to Earl Weaver with gestures. When Weaver follows Crawford to the plate, reportedly to ask him, what did you say? He becomes the first manager to get thrown out of a World Series game in 34 years. Baseball rules stipulate an automatic ejection if a manager comes out of the dugout to question an umpire's judgment on balls and strikes. In the Orioles' fifth, Seaver's judgment calls for a curveball to Dave Johnson. Johnson loops it to short left field. Cleon Jones makes a beautiful sliding catch. Here it is again. Going into the ninth, the Orioles still trail one to nothing. Frank Robinson is up with one out. Robinson singles to left. Now the meat of the Birds batting order is coming up. Boog Powell steps in. Powell's grounder gets through for a base hit. Moving Frank Robinson to third. The Orioles now have runners on first and third with only one out. Up steps Brooks Robinson. You may not believe what you're about to see. It is probably the most incredible catch in World Series history. Watch the right fielder, Ron Swoboda. the man of the hour, Ron Swoboda. Brooks Robinson was up, and I tried to play him a little bit closer because I wanted to eliminate the possibility of any ball dropping in front of me that I could possibly throw the run out at home plate. What did happen was he hit a line drive to my right. I thought I got a good jump on it because I wanted the ball to be hit to me. That's an important thing for an outfitter. I wanted the ball. What happened afterwards, I guess, was as big a surprise to me as it was to anyone in the stands. Uh, I had a dive for the ball. And when I left the ground, I had no idea that it would hit my glove. It hit and stuck. I came up and tried to throw, but it was useless. The run scored. The Orioles tied the score when Frank Robinson tagged up after Sobota's circus catch. Seaver gets out of the inning when Hendricks flies to Sobota. The fourth game of the World Series goes into extra innings. Seaver squeaks through the Baltimore 10. And so it goes to the bottom of the 10th. The score tied at one all. Dick Hall is the Oriole pitcher. Jerry Grody leads off with a pop fly to right, a seemingly routine out, but Buford is fooled. It drops between him and Belanger for a double. Once again, the Met magic is at work. Rod Gasper is put in to run for Jerry Grody. Al Weiss is intentionally walked to set up a force play situation.
When J.C. Martin is sent up to bat for Seaver, the Orioles change to a left-handed pitcher, Pete Riker. Martin dropped a superb bunt to the right side. Riker's throw ricochets off Martin's wrist, and Gasper comes home with a winning run. The Mets win it 2-1 to one and lead three games to one. This game-ending play produced a delayed controversy. Was it interference? Even though stop-action footage shows that J.C. Martin was in fair territory when hit, it was not ruled interference because, in the judgment of the home plate umpire, Martin did not intentionally interfere with the play. York City falls under the spell of the Mets. How did it happen? How did those lowly Mets reach this pinnacle? Fans everywhere are all in disbelief. They are all speechless. All that is, except for one. I believe the New York Mets are amazing, 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 amazing. They're just finding out now that it's just October and they found out now around the United States and all the patrons of New York City and Shea Stadium. They are amazing. They'll be amazing, amazing, amazing. And this year, I want you to follow them. They'll be known in all the periodicals because they'll be in South America. New Year's Day will be their best game. This year will get over in a hurry because the other clubs have to be strengthened more if they're going to do anything to surprise the amazing, amazing Mets. Joe DiMaggio, baseball's greatest living player, throws out the first ball for game five as the Mets shoot for baseball's world championship. It's a rematch between Dave McNally and Jerry Kuzman. In the top of the third, Mark Belanger leads off with a hit to right. Swoboda makes a surprise throw to first, for heads-up catcher Jerry Grody tries to win a shoving match. Pitcher Dave McNally up. The Mets are playing him to bunt. Some bunt. Into the Baltimore bullpen. The Orioles lead two to nothing. McNally's homer is the first extra base hit for Baltimore in 35 innings. And it proves contagious. With two out, Frank Robinson really bombs one over the left center field fence. And the Orioles now lead three to nothing in the top of the sixth it's still three to nothing as Kuzman again battles Frank Robinson it hits the bat says umpire Lou DeMiro it hit me first right here screams Frank Robinson it hit the bat after it hit me now in stop motion Kuzman's pitch it seems actually did hit Robinson and then bounced up to hit his bat you know, it's a lot tougher to call the play when you're standing behind the catcher and you don't have the benefit of stop-motion photography. Frank then looks at a third strike, which certainly doesn't help his feelings any. McNally now faces the Mets in the bottom of the sixth. The Birds leading 3-0. Cleon Jones is the leadoff batter. Lightning strikes twice. He too looks like he's hit by a pitch. But wait a minute. Is he or isn't he? Did he hit him? Yep. Oh, he hit him. How wonderful. Amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> Cleon has Don Clendenin carrying the argument for him. But the clincher comes when manager Gil Hodges brings out the evidence. See, a baseball with shoe polish on it from where the ball struck Cleon on the foot. The umpire admits the evidence is overwhelming and promptly awards Cleon Jones first base. The amazing Mets, it appears, even win their verbal battles. This naturally brings out Baltimore manager Earl Weaver with a few well-chosen words of his own. Destiny seems set against him. He's having the same results with arguments as he is with games. He isn't winning any. Now with a man on first, McNally has to face Clendenin, the series' most potent slugger. Clendenin really belts one. 
A tremendous home run, his third of the series, setting a record for a five-game series. Two-run score, and the Baltimore lead is cut to three to two. The hard-hitting Clendenin is destined to be named the series' most valuable player. The Mets at bat in the seventh. Al Weiss, not known for power, drives McNally's second pitch over the left center field fence to tie the score at 3 all. Weiss has never hit a homer in Shea Stadium during the two seasons he's been with the Mets. But isn't that first time something? The crowd loves it. Last of the eighth. Score tied three all. Ed Watt now pitching for the Orioles. Cleon Jones, the first man up, really lays into one. And just misses the home run. He winds up with a double. One out later, Ron Swoboda comes to bat. Swoboda belts a liner to left. Buford makes a nice running trap, but it goes for a double, scoring Cleon Jones with a lead run. Four to three now in favor of the Mets. With two out, Jerry Grody's up. Grody hits the ground to the right side. Powell bobbles it, picks it up, tosses to the pitcher who covers late. Watt drops the ball as Swoboda roars home from second with a Mets fifth run. The city's at a standstill. Everywhere, fans are glued to radio and television sets as the Mets get ready for the top of the ninth, leading five to three, needing only three more outs for the world championship. Frank Robinson leads off with a walk. Boog Powell is next. Powell forces Frank Robinson to second. Al Weiss to Bud Harrelson. One down. Brooks Robinson at the plate. It's a high fly to right field. Swoboda. Has it. Two outs, one more to go. Dave Johnson at bat. goes on and on and on. The New York weather report, cloudy with falling confetti. Thus ends one of the great sports stories of all time. Call it what you will, Mets mystique, Mets magic, luck, destiny. For sure, it was superb, dramatic, thrilling, exciting baseball.
amazing, 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 amazing,